why we might plant bamboo in this particular place. Privacy. Windbreak. Windbreak. Shady back here. Shady. Right, the taller stuff on the northern side so you don't create too much shade on the southern side. You, you hit most of them, all the good ones already, but there's a couple other ones. The building material, yep. Tomato steaks and, and, uh, and bean poles. Beauty. Someone in the last group said pandas. <laughs> <laughs> These are edible varieties. Cool. Uh, the big one, though, was we wanted a. When we first got here, this was a completely open, dead space. There was no reason to come back here at all except for the raspberries. Um, we didn't plant those. Um, <laughs> but we wanted some social spaces, some outdoor rooms, if you will, and we wanted bamboo. So what we observed matched very well with what we wanted. And so we observed westerly winds okay. coming across the backyard. We observed 40 windows looking into our backyard. There's, there's six houses across this street here that look back. Um, it was There was nothing growing back here, and we wanted to have another tree. And we wanted to create a little shady kind of Japanese garden. Um, <coughs> bless you. So, And we wanted edible bamboo. So all those things worked really well, and, and we decided to put it here. Uh, one thing we needed to do, though, is we needed to dig a trench to put our, a rhizome barrier in. Because this is a this is a running bamboo. It runs or, runs like a grass, uh, like a running grass, um, down two feet. So this plastic goes two feet down. This is another example of what not to do, though. Uh, our mistake is your is your opportunity to learn. Uh, this should not be at ground level. This should be four to six inches above ground level. Uh, because they jump over. Um, it, it, once a year, I, I do a walk around there because it's around the back too, the rising barrier. It's like a big a pot in the ground. Um, there's about three or four places where every year they'll jump over. I just I come by and I cut it. And then I have more material for the nursery. Because <laughs> so, um, yeah. if you can imagine, we, there's four neighbors in this corner. So if you didn't have that rising barrier, we'd have a lot of angry neighbors. Because it would literally take over not only our garden, but take over their, their lots as well. So it's something if you want to, there's clumping bamboos that don't run, but we wanted these varieties that are edible and and um, and running. Uh, this is a, this particular variety you can see has a, a kink in it. That's the natural growth. This is a, a yellow groove bamboo. Um, I don't remember the other two names, but all phyllostachys. And if you want to ask very particular questions of bamboo, uh, hold them to Steve's house because he's got 60 varieties, uh, much more. That's where these are from. 60 varieties or 50 varieties of party bamboos. How fast do these grow? Good question. Thanks for uh, asking that. I'd like to show this one. So here's the yellow groove bamboo. You can see it with the yellow. The groove actually has a yellow in it, so that's why it's called yellow groove. This one right here. And this is brand new from this year. <laughs> wow. Not only that, that awesome. is it, it, it started in May. It took two weeks to get that size. Oh. Oh. Uh, two weeks. You can almost see it growing. Wow. <laughs> and this is about, would you say that's 30, 25, 30 feet tall? That, this, is, this variety gets about 30 feet tall, so it's almost full size. And it grow, once it gets established, it, all the shoots will go full size in two weeks. It keeps its leaves. Evergreen. Thank you. But this year we had some, some harsh uh, times during winter, so the leaves did die and fall. But it wasn't cold enough to kill the wood, so they just created, they just sprouted new leaves. new shoots the first six inches when they come up so when this one went for two weeks <laughs> the first two days you get it um, and you can you pull back the hard outer part 
and the heart is what you eat and chop up and eat it. And I ate some this year. One limiting thing for us is a very small grove. So if we're using them for tomato steaks and bean poles and we're eating them, we're really, they only produce about four or five shoots a year. So, because it's most because it's the shade, the soil's not very good, um, it's a small patch. So we don't eat these that much. You could if you had a bigger patch. If you cut it down at ground level for a tomato stick, you got to send up another shoot? No. It, it hmm. has buds on it. So if you cut one of the buds, it, it has to be another bud that grows to get new, new growth. Um, I mean, there might if you cut it, you know, here's the stalk. There might be I've buds all played. around it that might yeah. shoot up. But there's no guarantee that that might happen. So we try that. We're just letting them get established. And, and later on, down the road, we might have more we can eat. Um, this behind us here is a uh, mimosa tree. So we wanted a tree that was useful to us. It didn't cast too much shade. It's kind of dappled, light dappled shade. Something that that um, provided, um, in this case, we wanted more nitrogen fixing trees. So we wanted, and we didn't want a lot of trees out there in the sun. So this is a good opportunity to put a nitrogen fixing tree here that created dappled shade. Uh, this is mimosa or silk tree, um, and it's more of a southern tree. So like down in Virginia where you're from, this is a weed. Uh, here it's not as hardy, so there aren't very many of these that grow much beyond Holyoke going north. Um, in fact, the seed pods don't ripen very well, so you, you only will ever have, you only see a mimosa if someone's planted it, physically planted it. It doesn't tend to seed very easily because they don't ripen very well. So we can keep this, you know, fairly pruned well. The winter prunes it some because it, it's sometimes too cold and the, the tips die back. Uh, it's one of the best hummingbird attracting plants. The, the, the pink puffball flowers are very, uh, smell like um, cotton candy, look like cotton candy. Uh, it's just pretty, you know, it has a nice aesthetic to it. A new uh, addition is as the system grows, we have to adapt sometimes because it gets too shady and so things die back that wanted more sun earlier in the, in the the design of the polyculture. This year we put in a um, arctic kiwi. That's this right here, and it's a vine. And the goal is to trellis it up a tree, and in a couple years we'll be picking fruit from the, part of the arctic kiwi. That's a hardy kiwi. That needs full sun, it needs a lot of room. This is an arctic kiwi which takes shade and is very much dwarfing, more dwarfing than the, the hardy kiwi. But I've seen this, there's a patch of it in Northampton uh, and a couple of places I've heard about it growing where if it's in full shade, a moist full shade, kind of a swampy area, uh, it would fill in the area as big as our backyard. It's another running uh, plant. Uh, some people that have planted it are very upset now. <laughs> they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. Uh, and here we, we control it two ways. Draw it two ways. One is we eat it when it runs this way, and it hits the rhizome barrier when it runs that way. So here we're, and it's <clears throat> really dry, so it keeps it kind of um, corralled. If so. <coughs> but if this was <clears throat> swampy shade and we didn't have any barriers to it, it would be as vigorous as the bamboo would be. So just be careful with this one. But it's beautiful, uh, beautiful plant. What was it called again? Uh, giant Colt's Foot is one name. Giant Pedicites is another name. Uh, and Fuki, F-U-K-I, the Japanese.